Greetings, music nerds, and welcome to Season 7 of the Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast. I'm your host, Steve Dawson, coming to you from the Hen House Studio here in East Nashville, Tennessee. I'm so glad you've chosen to join me once again as we take some deep dives with a cast of wonderful musicians, producers, and engineers that I've managed to track down and speak to about making music, records, and just doing what they do in their lives and music. Don't forget there's a link to a playlist on Spotify and Apple Music with links to many of the songs we discuss on today's episode. You'll find links to those playlists in the show notes below or at our website. Meanwhile, the show continues to be largely listener supported. Your help in keeping the show going is always appreciated and you can do it with a one-time donation or a Patreon subscription, which is a monthly payment of your choice. And when you sign up for Patreon, you get an ad-free version of the show to listen to, as well as getting entered to win a cunning prize pack from our sponsors at the end of the season. Or if you're tight for dough and you still want to help out, you can subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or just by spreading the word, sharing the show, following us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, and telling all your pals about it. You can get links to all this stuff at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Meanwhile, a huge thanks to the sponsors this season. Please check them out and let them know I sent you. They are Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra 1964, The Deering Banjo Company, Mule Resophonic Guitars, and The Henhouse Hang. All right, thanks so much to you for tuning in, and let's get down to it. Howdy, music nerds, and welcome back to the show. This is episode number 148, and my guest today is a killer guitarist, composer, and side person from Los Angeles, Molly Miller. That's Dr. Molly Miller to you, listener. Thanks for tuning in again. It's great to be back here with you today. I hope everyone's had a great summer. It's kind of the end of summer now, I guess. Whether that meant working your butts off on the road or just kicking back and taking some time off, this COVID thing's been going bonkers again. So I hope everyone has managed to avoid that. It's one of those things that's not really as terrifying as it used to be, but as a musician, it can still throw a huge wrench in your plans and that totally sucks. So avoid it still. And there's of course other complications with it, but that's a big one. It's really screwed up a lot of things this summer for a lot of people that I know. So, uh, yeah, steer clear of COVID. If you can, you know how to do that. Uh, yeah, I've had a few busy weeks here, which has been great tracking up a storm on three different projects for artists who came in to make records here in Nashville with me. And it was great fun. And I've been lucky enough to work with some killer musicians and artists in that time. All that tracking also means that I now have to flip the studio around and get ready to mix these records. I know some of you out there are on the recording side of the music world, and I'm sure you can relate to how different of a mindset it is to go from tracking to mixing. It's totally a different uh, side of the brain. It's something I started doing about 15 years ago, and now I pretty much mix everything that I record and produce here. I still mix projects as well that I don't record myself, and I'm happy to do that. But for stuff that I record here, it's just way more financially feasible for me to mix it as well. How do you guys deal with that out there? I guess it's becoming a lot more attainable too, as people can do a pretty killer job totally in the box. I do a, like a hybrid setup here where I do some things in the box and ultimately everything goes through my console and I use a lot of hardware and some plugins. So it's, it's uh, yeah, best of both worlds, I guess. It's always changing. It's cool that there's so many ways to do it these days. I appreciate the people who can do it all on their computer, but I still like the tactile side of that part of the recording process and the mixing process. And uh, I also like not having to look at a screen all day and use my ears and just listen. So that's why I do what I do. Anyway, that'll be me for the next few weeks, just mixing away and getting caught up on all that. And I'll be doing a few shows this fall, some with my band, the Volcano Brothers around Nashville. That's my Hawaiian band with Fats Kaplan and Dave Jakes. And then an annual show in Vancouver, and that's in October. And that's where we bring in multiple guests and put on a big old show. And uh, I musical direct that and organize the band. We've done it for years. It's always really fun. So hope to see some of you out there this fall. Now, as a reminder, anyone that's a Patreon member will be automatically entered into our um, yearly contest and the winner will be picked randomly from the Patreon subscribers. It's going to be uh, a bunch of cool stuff, including a pedal from Union Tube and Transistor and some other things that I'm not even totally sure what they're going to be yet from some of the other sponsors of the year, but you'll find out soon enough. So you can sign up for that with a minimal monthly payment to support the show over at the website makersandshakerspodcast.com. Hit the donate button and you can go over to Patreon and sign up there. 
And I would just like to shout out to a new donor this week who is generous enough to help support the show. I couldn't do it without you, so many thanks to Bruce Rowe. So Molly Miller is on the show today, and I saw Molly first. She was playing a show at Nelson Drum Shop here in Nashville with Jay Belarus and Jen Condos, and it was really cool. I hadn't actually heard of her before, but I went to see Jay, who I know well, and then I saw this band, and they were awesome, and I went and got my mitts on most of Molly's albums after seeing that show. She's got a really unique style that's rhythmic and aggressive, but also really extremely melodic and the trio was just insanely cool. She's got a great voice on the electric guitar. It's kind of jazz, kind of not jazz. It's sort of one of those hard to describe styles. So her story is that she's carved out this cool way to make her living, which is a combo of playing live and recording and touring with people and then teaching at university. And she's deep into that. In fact, she's a doctor of music. And I honestly can't say that about pretty much anyone else that I know in music. I mean, I, I know a few of my like college teachers that were doctors, I guess, but not very many. And I certainly don't know anyone that I play with or work with now that's a doctor. So Molly is the only one. That's cool. And uh, she was the chair of the guitar department at Los Angeles College of Music and is currently a professor of studio guitar at University of Southern California. And she records and tours regularly as well with Jason Mraz as his guitar player. She's known him for years, and she really suits a gig like that really well. Her Just musically, she fits in great into that sort of situation as well. So between all those things, she seems to have it all figured out. But to hear her at her finest, go check out one of the Molly Miller Trio albums. And that, those are, I think they're all featuring Jen Condos and Jay Belarus. That's the trio. There's a few albums, but the latest one is called St. George, and it's really killer, sort of a balance between like really improv and also really well thought out and arrange tunes and it's captured really well and sounds amazing. So we also talk on the show today about a new album that she's made with that trio and that'll be coming out sometime in the new year it sounds like. I'm not sure when exactly and at the time of us doing this conversation she did not know either but maybe she will soon. So keep your eye on her website and you can keep up with all of her projects and tour dates there at mollymillermusic.com. So let's get down to it. Please enjoy my conversation with Molly Miller. I thought we could maybe jump in and uh, I want to talk about your records and stuff, but also um, I'm interested in the path you've taken with education. You're a doctor, a doctor of music. Doctor of guitar, yep. And when I thought about it, I realized that I don't think I know anybody else that has a doctor in music. I mean, I know a lot of people do out there, but yeah. in the practice conditioning musician field. I honestly can't think of a single one that I know. And I know a lot of musicians. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Like, was that was education something that you really were drawn to? Or were you just sort of in it and and just kind of like saw it through to the end? Because that's what you were doing? Or like, what was your process in getting into it and going through? I don't know how many years it takes to be a doctor, but probably seven or eight or nine or something, right? Yeah, you know, um, it happened very organically, I'd say. It was it not did. like I was like 17 or 16 or 12 and I was like, I want to be a guitar professor and teach me. Like, it was not <laughs> that clear at all. And I actually sort of didn't want to do each degree as I got each degree originally. But yeah, basically, when I was 16, I, like, as soon as I got my license, I got a job and I was like working at uh like a party planning place that like specialized in really? making minimum wage <laughs> which in like whatever 2005 or something it was like seven dollars an hour you know yeah. um and then someone asked me to do guitar lessons and i was like oh my god i can be like i forget how much i charge like 30 dollars an hour or something i was like this is amazing i can make 30 dollars an hour instead of seven that's like a whole I know, lot right? of work <laughs> So like, that's how I started teaching. It wasn't like, wow, I want to give back. There was no conscious like, decision. It was like organically kind of happened at first, just like simple math. Um, but then I really enjoyed it. And for a while, I think I was kind of resistant to the idea of putting a lot of energy into my like education because, you know, I think there's this false notion of if you can't play, you teach or you don't do, you teach. Um, yeah. 
But then, you know, I kind of looked around me and there were so many people who I loved as musicians and respected as musicians that were also educators, you know, yeah. my professors at USC, one of my mentors, you know, yeah, like Adam Levy, Patrice Russian, all these people that I kind of were like mentors to me, Bruce Foreman, um, that I really looked up to. And um, I was like, wow, like it's and I, I they were they had such a huge impact on me that it uh, I think kind of switched something inside of me and made me realize how much. I love teaching. And also I'm a, a highly anxious young woman who wants to have stability in my life in an extremely yeah. unstable world. Like, you know, being, it's like, I want to be a guitar player and also have stability. It's like, ha ha. So I found a lot of stability through education as well. And yeah. even when I was getting my degrees at this point, it wasn't that thought out. It was just kind of like, oh, I'm a TA. So my education's paid for and I like teaching and, I, it, it, you know, I'll do it till it doesn't work. And so I ended up being at USC for nine years. I, I was four years undergrad, two years master's. Um, that's it. And then three years, my doctorate. Whoa. And, this, yeah. this is USC in LA strictly or were you moving around at all or is that? Oh, my God. Just no, I've never left Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I used to be like, I need to leave. I'm just like, I love, I love LA. My world is here. My family's here. My, my boyfriend's yeah. here. My gigs yeah. are here, you know? So yeah, I love this city a lot. Um, but no, it was all at USC, all at USC Thornton school of music, like studio guitar program. So in those nine years, were you ever like, this is ridiculous. I got to get out of this school thing and like get on the road or like to that. That's pretty much what happens to everyone I know. But that you just sort of avoided that whole crisis. Well, I think I was really fortunate. A few things happened. Number one, I was gigging a ton. Like I was honestly like living a double life. I was working it. I was teaching at USC, doing like undergrad, like non-major classes, getting my degrees um, and also gigging probably four nights a week and rehearsing. Like yeah. I was okay. like, you know, I do a bar gig, come home at two, wake up at eight and go teach or whatever, like go to USC and take a, a history class. You know, I could not do it now, but like yeah. in my twenties, I was like, yeah. And I think I was good at compartmentalizing. Also, it was like, I'm getting a degree and I'm getting paid like this also notion to this sort of rational, like, and it's not just about money, but I was, it was this kind of incredible opportunity. Yeah. I kept thinking of like, I'm getting paid to get an education. Like yeah. that's why, like most people go in debt and I have this like beautiful opportunity to like teach guitar, which I enjoy, get my education paid for and gig. So I was just kind of like juggling and hustling so hard. And I'm someone who likes to be busy and, and like, I kind of thrive you know, a very extrovert. I like thrive being around people and jumping from thing to thing. And while I've definitely had to like <laughs> tone it back a bit since like that era of my life. Yeah. For me, it was like, there was definitely, you know, moments where I was like driving to school. I was like, oh, like, you know, all my friends get to sleep in and don't have to like try to juggle as much, but I'm so grateful that I did it. And it just worked out perfectly. Like I started doing more out of town stuff when my like it, it just lined up perfectly like i graduated from usc in like may of whatever 2016 or something and at that point i was gigging a lot and doing some out of town stuff but not more than like a couple weeks per semester uh -huh. um you know and a lot of travel stuff was in the summer anyways so it all kind of lined up well and then i graduated from usc in may and i think in like june or july jason Mraz emails me asking if i would be in his band and like right. that's when my touring really started to kick off so i've just like even right now, I'm actually teaching at USC right now. And yeah. before that, I was at Los Angeles College of Music running their guitar department and teaching. And like, I've just been so fortunate and I'm so scared for when my like, like the dance that just works out really well doesn't work out. Like I keep anticipating every semester. I'm like, good, like, like gig gods, please like let the, like this last semester, yeah. like we had like a week of work in March that lined up with spring break. And like, you know, I have out of town stuff that starts the day after finals. It's just been, I've been so fortunate with the, the gods of my schedule that like allow things to kind of fit in the pockets. That it's was funny how pocket. that can sort of work out sometimes. I, I, before COVID, I was touring with two bands and and I always thought it was going to be like a total nightmare of scheduling, but somehow it just like magically sort of worked out. Yeah. So I know that, that juggly feeling. Yes. So when you're talking about teaching, are you talking about teaching classes or were you just teaching privately through like, what was the, what were you actually teaching that whole time? 
Yeah. So a couple things. So I was at Los Angeles College of Music. I was the like the department head, the chair of the guitar department, guitar department for like five, six years. And that just ended, in, you know, at the beginning of this year, I, I stopped work. I, I left that that job. But during that time, I was teaching classes, designing curriculum. I probably designed like I re- designed and redesigned the undergraduate program like three or four times and created a master's program when I was, there. So I was doing like curriculum design course building, teaching classes, but not crazy hours there. I was probably really, and I took, I would take quarters off if I was touring a lot. Like they were very uh, cool about that with me. Now Uh USC, I started working there. uh, I've been there three semesters. I'm going to start my fourth one in the fall. Um, And that one I've been teaching classes and privates. So I'm there two days a week, you know, and it, Uh, you're not the head of the guitar department there. No, okay. I'm, which is like a night. I don't have to go to as many meetings. So I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Less Zooms, I'm in. Is, is your more. teaching all strictly guitar or are you teaching like composition or ensemble yeah. stuff as well? I mean, I've ta- like when I was at the other college, I did like theory classes, a lot of ensembles at USC. It's pretty much all guitar stuff, but like guitar ensemble, like uh, trio guitar, like good. Yeah. So it is like. But it, that was more like my students. I, I've had some non-major students, actually. Like I had a vocal student, a bass student um, oh, okay. last semester. But most of my classes are guitar centric, whether that be like, right. like jazz. But they're all the students are so good. Like, that's the thing that is so cool about right. being there is like, I can't exp- like all the USC students. Like Thornton has is like what is an incredible unit is like an incredible program, incredible conservatory. So my students are great and I, I i my while sometimes i fight against it like i think it's it's good to be a little fearful good to have a little anxiety good to just yeah. be like or to be challenged would be a less aggressive way to say that i'd say yeah so whether it's a gig or a teaching thing like you know most of my teaching things i'm not like stressed about at all but being at usc the students are really great so i do feel like i need to be very present and very thoughtful and i try to do that with everything but same with a gig like i never want to yeah. do a gig i'm bored by like that's the antithesis of why i'm doing this you know right yeah, you yeah. Know, i want to grow and be challenged and learn and be present and engage and so I, I feel really fortunate that you know my gigs that i play like there's something that's always exciting and challenging about them so tell me about your classes. What are the what are the actual titles of the classes? My titles, uh, NPGU, like five. They have like numbers. Like the oh, ones really? at USC are numbers. The ones at LACM, I think they have titles too. But it's but you like, said you mentioned like guitar trio and things like like is that what are the variables within the, the world of guitar that you're actually teaching classes on? Yeah, so I've taught solo guitar. I taught the, a solo guitar class to like a. a Upper level students and graduate students. I've taught that class a couple times. Trio guitar, which is an ensemble class where it's a, uh, you know, different a guitar player will walk up and play with a bass and drummer, and they'll bring in charts, and we talk about the charts and the tune and how they're playing. Like I love trio playing. Oh, so it's oh. not. It doesn't mean three guitars. It means a trio built around the guitar. Yeah. Well, okay. there are guitar ensemble classes of like five guitar players and a drummer and bass player, and I've taught oh. those at the other college um, at USC. No, it's like. Guitar with rhythm section, duo guitar, solo guitar. Um, there was like a jazz, a, a sophomore jazz class that I taught this year too. Um, yeah. So, so what do you what do you teach in a trio class? Like, what? How do you actually approach it? I guess like it must be different. How many students are in that class? It varies. That class is like is a class that like it's funny because I used to take this class with Frank Potenza. I took this class probably it was like an ensemble that I. I really was uh foundational for my trio it was really a great I loved the class and I so love teaching it because there's so many things about trio playing like you bring in a chart yeah it's kind of your thing right yeah trio playing like and it's funny like the classes I teach are like my favorite things to do like I love creating solo guitar arrangements and I love trio playing um those are probably my Two of my, I mean, I also love playing in a band, but like we're a bigger band, but like, yeah, trio guitar playing, I'm like super passionate about. It's like, you're talking about arranging, getting your charts that are coherent, uh, communicating with other musicians on stage, using voicings, how's your tone? um, And like, also, you know, they're playing tunes and it's like, are you addressing the harmony coherently? Are you building solos? Are you compelling? And like, it depending on the student and what the tune is, like, like the thing that's so fun is it gets 
real heady and like we're getting to the nitty gritty of things at a, like a, a really nerdy level of like trio guitar, whether that's like yeah. what scale you're using, the pickup you should be on. Um, did you really? put, yeah, like, and even like within a chart, it's like, do you put your DC on the top or the bottom of this? You know, it's like, how are your, is your, how are you, how you're communicating with the band? Like, you know, is, yeah. is your shoulder move like, like, are you making eye contact? Are you being clear? And like, there's so many things. Like, are your voicings how many? Like, are you playing in the right octave? What if you play the melody to lower octave? That actually might like, uh, I don't know, tell a better story and all those sorts of things that I think about in my own playing a ton when I'm creating arrangements and playing. Like, you know, I I do trio gigs a ton and a lot with Jen and Jay, but also sometimes just like you know a pickup band of friends that, and I have charts that I'll pull out because while. I do these gigs. I I still do sometimes. And I did a ton of gigs where you just call tunes and play. Yeah. There's something to me that's kind of cool about not just doing that, but having some preconceived notions about things. Like I do like, I like it all, but I mean, I think, um, and you don't have to, but sometimes it's nice to play an arrangement where it's really intentional and it's not like, Oh, let's just trade fours. It's like, actually we have like this line that the drummer soloing under that has specific hits and it's really well thought out. And I love doing both. I did a gig last week with a different bassist and drummer and we did some just tune calling, but some charts and some like variations, but yeah. I, I, I tune love... calling. You mean like standards? Yeah. But also like some pop tunes and some standards, some R and B tunes. Yeah. some just like, yeah. Oh, this is simple. And some like here, I have a lead sheet, but follow me on like really clear cues. Like, right. Yeah. I, to me, like communicating with other people in a really clear way is super important because mm-hmm. yeah, I want to like feel you musically, but also, yeah. And I think like you can be present musically and with your body and doing it both and, or you don't need both, but like sometimes you can be really clear with your eyes shut or yeah, for, for sure. I like to do that too. I don't know. So when you teach that class, do you have a drummer and bass player at your disposal in the in the room? Yeah, they're they're students, and you know, okay. USC students are marvelous. So it's it's fun to work with um, the students as well and get their opinion. And some of them, you know, will be vocal and be like, or and some of them aren't. Some of them like, you know. I love that class. Yeah, I bet. So that's like one of the main ones that you teach, or is it sort of spread between like solo things and that thing? And yeah. The trio one's consistent. What I've done pretty much every semester is taught trio guitar, although that one's shifted to duo at one point because there was like, it was a small class. We just did because there weren't quite as many students. So it's, you know, funding and whatever. So they're like, we'll do duo. But um, typically when what is like coming up, what it looks like is it'll be like, you know, one day a week is trio guitar. And then one day a week is uh, like, like whether that be some sort of a solo guitar class or that sophomore jazz guitar class. Um, and once again, I've taught there three semesters. So it's not like, yeah. So it still is like new. And I'm like, what am I going to do this semester? Well, yeah. there's more of a plan this year. Um, I, I stepped in last minute when Frank Potenza couldn't be there. So he retired. So I've been te- teaching his classes, but still my okay. role there is technically temporary. You know, I, okay. I'm there for, I think another year. And then, you know, I mean, I hope, yeah, I love being there. It's a lot of fun. In an ideal situation, considering how much work you do as a live performer as well, do you want to keep that rolling? Are you, yeah. Do you feel like, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I think my ideal situation is like, I love what I do right now. Like, I feel re- like I'll do, I, I'd like to do a little bit more with my trio. We're putting out a record, which I have like, uh, which I'm putting out a record at the top of next year. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to do more touring with that. But the nice thing is like, I can schedule it. So I can schedule it, you know, when I'm not, I only teach really the thing you have to remember with these like university jobs, it's September, October, November, essentially. And then, so it's eight months a year, which is, you know, not that much. And then, um, so I still get like big pockets, like summer, I get all of May, June, July. I get like three and a half months in summer where I can tour, which I'm doing right now. I'm about to go out for six weeks. Um, So, yeah, like it's kind of I feel lucky that I can schedule things um, where it works out. But like I don't schedule Jason gigs, but those have worked out. My trio gigs I get to schedule. So, you know, I've been fortunate with that where I don't have to miss very much school. But yeah, like the dream is to be able to tour, perform, record and be able to teach as well. 
Yeah, I think certain seasons keep the stable gig. Yeah, like, and I think season, like, it'll be seasonal, and I think that's yeah. like what I'm, I'm, you know, every yeah, and I, that that's the the goal is to do teaching, but not ever have that be full time. I love touring, but I don't want to tour twelve like eleven months out of the year. Like, yeah. I love my life in LA too, but I love also performing for me is like a high like no other. You know, it's like how I connect to a, a, a larger thing than myself. Um, yeah, and I love playing for artists too. Like I feel like if I can do my thing, play with artists and then um, teach. So I'm like living my dream, but it's just keeping it all together, having it continue to evolve, continuing to challenge myself in all of these different areas of my life. So let's talk about your trio then. So the trio, like I saw you guys at Nelson Drum Shop here in Nashville. Cool. That was an awesome show, yeah. Um, and Jay is a friend of mine. And Jen, I know a little bit. She, I worked with her a lot during the pandemic because she was like engineering a bunch of stuff for, that totally. I was working on begrudgingly. Uh, but, um, <laughs> I know, I've been in those moments. <laughs> <laughs> the record that you made, St. George, that was like a couple of years ago, I guess. And I would like to talk about that. But so you've just done a new record with the same crew? Yeah. So it's funny oh, how slow okay. things move. But yeah, we have a new record that it's like I have a couple of meetings, actually. I have like a bunch of meetings coming out, coming up right now about like exactly my plan. But it's going to be top of 2020. Four. it's fun. We've been playing these songs since like we wrote them all during the pandemic. Um, so we've been playing those songs for a while. And while St. George, I'm proud of and like, go listen and whatever, like that feels like, you know, an older version of the trio and the new mm -hmm. record I'm really excited about. And even now we have a bunch of new songs since the new record that we recorded. So, right. you know, tell me a bit about the, your process with like writing and composing, arranging for that trio in particular, like from my experiences with Jay, like he doesn't read charts particularly. If I'm working with him on a session, he just wants lyrics. He doesn't, he doesn't look at a chord chart. <laughs> so I can't imagine he's really reading stuff with you. He's a vibe guy yeah and jen however would probably have to read charts like so how much time do you spend like pre-arranging before you take tunes into those two it, they vary so sometimes i typically have an idea of what i want to do and mm -hmm. sometimes it's completely shifted by the end of a rehearsal and sometimes it stays pretty true and the songs are it's a mixture some songs i write and some songs jen and i write together we often like on the new record and the, the last record we we co-write a couple we co-wrote a few of the songs together the mm -hmm. new record it's more than half are like jen and mine co-writes which is really fun uh, cool. so she, like, i guess we should say that this is jen condos and jay bellaros because yes. i actually i don't think i mentioned that before yes <laughs> so we sorry. All, like the, they're the best. So, so it's Jen and I sometimes write stuff together and the we'll typically do it virtually. Like right, even though I see her okay. at least once a week, sometimes way more than that, like she'll send me a section and I send her and then like I'll write to it or I send her a section and she writes to it. Um, but then but typically what happens is whether it's a song that I've written or me and her have written together, you know, I sit with my guitar and I have some ideas of like, like, is there a solo on this song? Is there going to be, you know, a drum feature? Should we start it like this? Are there like breaks? Um, you know, I'll typically have some ideas about what I want to do. Um, but then I show up and sometimes they completely get shifted. And, you know, like Jay and Jen are both like, I, I've learned so much from them. I respect them so much. I love, we love working together. I can say that like, we love working together because it is so collaborative. Like sometimes I come in and they're like, you got it. That's great. And you know, Jay does a drum. I never tell Jay what to play. I play, yeah. he has this incredible thing where he listens to what you're doing. And it's like, you know, he has this like sixth sense of like how to, um, I don't like how to push it forward in a non-obvious way, but in, it's so musical and it's always so interesting. But it's so specific, you know? So, yeah. So then. So, so do you find that you, that you come back like two weeks later or something? My experience with, with him, I don't know about Jen as much, but with Jay, it's like he'll approach some, a song one way, one time. And even from take to take, let alone week to week, he, yeah. he'll play it completely differently. Yes. We, I mean, we we actually like, so our newest song is this song, Jen wrote an A section, I wrote a B section. And it's like kind of like an uptempo jazz, you know, and it's like mm -hmm. this like melody, like a beat, Jen and I are playing it together um, with like drum hits. And it started that way. And now it's like 
Jay was like, had an idea. He was like, what if I kind of make it Latin-y and like do a different vibe on it? And we're like, let's try it. And, you know, we went back and forth and like the second idea, which we had already been playing this song for a few weeks and then he shifted. So yeah, sometimes he shifts and there's always things that are being developed. I'd say too, it's not like we do a song and it's done. Like, I feel like we'll have an idea and then things get shifted um, as we play it more. Cause when the three mm-hmm. of us are in town, like I do, you know, we play, we play sometimes like a lot. Um, which is yeah. How, like how, how often do you get together with those guys? I mean, the last couple of months have sucked because Jay's been out of town and I've been out of town a yeah. lot too. So Jay, it's Jay gets back July 9th from Allison. And we did a gig like two, we did, I think two gigs when he was home for a couple of weeks in between his tour, he gets home July 9th. We have a gig that night because I'm leaving two oh days God. later. So, <laughs> and then I'll get back and we have some stuff in October. We're playing SF jazz libretto. It looks like we're playing Zebulon. Like we have some stuff set up, but like, I'm kind of knowingly right now, like we'll do local gigs over the net, like for the rest of the year, but Oh yeah. And San Francisco, but I can't in like the next year is when I'm going to really try to push a bunch of stuff outside of just, you know, Southern California. Um, yeah. but when we're here, like it varies. Like sometimes we'll play like, I don't know. We could play like five gigs in a month and we'll be like, there's a spot in LA. Like we have some like just steady spots. We play in LA like 1642, which is one of my favorite bars. We play there a lot verse, which is Manny American. He owns that spot in the Valley and we play there a lot. Um, yeah. So there's like spots. We'll just kind of play and some casual gigs we do as like almost background music sometimes. And then sometimes it's a proper show, but we just okay. love playing where it is like, yeah. you'd think like, I can't like, we'll go from playing like, the Monterey jazz festival to like a restaurant sometimes, you know? And and I I think it's important to treat them all with the same amount of, I don't know, attention and intentionality, which Jen and Jay do too. It's just like, let's play together. Let's, let's do our job, which is to entertain people and being engaging and be present and like be true to the music. Do you do trio shows with different players too? Like if you get a gig and they're not available, what do you do? Yeah, I do that. Okay. Um, so I have a few other people I play with on each instrument, like Jen and Jay, it's just, it's a different, like we, it's, it's a thing. Like that's the three of us and that's our sound. We've played together for like eight years or something, nine years. And we weren't, we weren't playing as regularly the first couple of years, but I'd say, you know, the last like six years, seven years, we've like been a band. Um, Yeah. But I like, yeah, like a couple last week, I think it was, I played with Elizabeth Goodfellow and JP Maramba, a different trio. And cause like Jay's out of town, I think Jen couldn't do it or something. Yeah. So like, I totally do different gigs. I'll do gigs with different, tri- with different people sometimes. And we do some of the okay. teams, but they're, I, I don't think of them even as like, mm, I, I can't think of them as the same because Jen and Jay are so specific and they're their own, they have their own voices. So, you know, yeah. I wouldn't want someone that would be, yeah. Cause like, I know on the other end, if someone's like hires you and then they're like, why don't you sound like the person that normally does this gig? It's like, cause I'm not that person, you know, right. I think the thing that's really fun about playing with different people is like, you get to play with a different person and, and, and they're like, I would never want someone to play a Jay Bellarose drum group. Cause they're going to sound like they're just trying to be Jay instead of themselves. One thing that I really like about that St. George record, and I don't know if it's changed at all for you, but it's like, it's sort of jazz. It's sort of not jazz. Like it's not as there's quite a bit of improv, but it's like very song oriented. It's like songs without vocals. It's like the instrumental concept is very strong, but it feels different from jazz in the sense that you're not just like getting through the head so that you can start shredding solos. It's like well thought out harmonic variations and like really cool harmonies between the instruments and things like that. So there's obviously like quite a bit that gets worked out prior to going into the studio. Has that changed since you did the St. George and with the new record, was it a similar kind of approach where it's like the instrumental is like a song? That's the line Jen says. She's like, we're bringing the instrumentals back and bringing the instrumental back. You know, you think of like (laughs) Booker T and the MGs or Dwayne Eddy, uh, you know, there's like so many, uh, Dick Dale, all these people where it's like, they played songs and that was the song. It wasn't like- And they were hits. Yeah. And so like, that's, we're very intentionally like, these are songs like Booker T and the MGs, I think is a good example because sometimes we'll do covers and our covers are really intentional. Like it's not, things aren't thrown away. It's not like, this is just a group. It's like, we're three people and every person like is an important part of that puzzle. Uh, And yeah, the songs are big. Like we're thinking about arrangements. We're thinking about songs. Like there's always a meaning behind my songs that like there's, you know, something, a feel, whether it's just like a feeling 
or something bigger than that. But yeah, the next record during COVID Jen was like, I want to do a song of we- like a rest, a Western record. And oh. while it's not so on the nose there, you can definitely hear like the Western. So I feel like, I mean, I feel like to my music. Yeah. My music is like, yes, there's jazz elements, but like, we're not a jazz band. And it's not like it's like, you know, an, an, a jam band there. It's very intentional. Like these are songs, the arrangements are yep. clear and you're going to hear like, you know, solos, like, like in jazz, you're going to hear, yeah, instrumental music. But um, yeah, I think of it as like, so someone said something like Bill Frizzell meets Dick Dale. Yeah, like that. And with probably some like, I guess, yeah, folk, jazz, groove, songs, now some, some spaghetti Western vibes too. Yeah. Mm hmm. Cool. <laughs> like on St. George, I don't, I didn't, I haven't analyzed it closely, but I don't think there's any overdubs on there. Like, do you, as a guitar player, do you feel inclined to overdub or is it like, are you holding yourself back from getting in there and like layering things up at all? Or is there more of that on the new record or yeah. how, how, what's your approach to that? There's one song on, on St. George, which is like the outro, which I, uh, whenever you call reprise, like that's what the one song I overdubbed. Um, but I think because we spend so much time as a trio working songs out, like mm-hmm. I'm trying it's intent, to, it's intention yeah. is to be that, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I love layering, layering guitar tracks. Like, I think that's so fun. Like you have like a, a whole, you can have a whole band on just your instrument, you know, you play, it's like, I think layering guitar parts is fun, um, and makes sense in certain settings, but, and I love doing it in the studio for other projects, but for the Molly Miller trio, it, we're very much trying to capture this live. So it, yeah, so how what you hear live is is what you hear on a record. But obviously, yeah, it's slightly different. But yeah, no overdubs. Jay did a cut does like a couple of percussion overdubs. Yep, I can tell that. I know his I know his overdub um, process too. Yeah. yeah, and I think no, no guitar overdubs on the new record. I think. And Jay okay. did some percussion. Yeah, there's something about it. Like, I don't know. I think I, I think of like uh, I, I I don't necessarily necessarily always align with like contemporary ways of recording, you know, like and obviously I take advantage of some of the things. But there's something to me that's like I don't know, if it's like being nostalgic or the like the fire that it puts under me of like we're gonna be here we're gonna be live we're gonna do this whole record in like a day and a half and like like that's all like and there's something to me and i think jen and jay love that too of like this like you have to be present you have to be here we have to breathe together so like and just like and there's and it's not you don't get to like feather it with a bunch of other stuff. It's like right. the feathering is maybe like an EQ or a reverb, you know, it's not like, yeah. OK, and now you're going to like, you know, the auto tune and the four guitar tracks that are going to hide the thing. Yeah, there's something so raw about it that I love. Tell me about where you did the new record and St. George and and who was involved, like engineering wise and all yeah. that, too. Yeah. So uh, St. George was done at United which is oh, a cool. wonderful studio. And Mike Piersante was the engineer and mixed it. And okay. I'm, I'm sure if you're friends with Jay, you know, Mike, like, and if you're not, I don't know him personally, but I I'm well aware of his work with like T-Bone Burnett and stuff. Like totally. That. Yeah. yeah. And he, it was so fun working with him. Like Mikey is amazing. And he also did my brother's record, Sammy Miller and the congregation. So I got to work with him a few months before that. Um, and I was like, and he's, it, it was great. And I, we changed it up, not because I don't love Mikey, but because schedules and stuff. Um, so on the second record, we did it at Valentine in the Valley in like Valley village. Uh, Valentine. What's that place? It's cool. It has a vibe. Um, and I had recorded there once and had a really good experience and Jay had been recording there a bunch. It's like this, it's almost like you go into a time capsule and I, I don't think I'm going to butcher it. It's something like there was a recording <laughs> studio that was open and then they like quickly closed in like 1970 or something. I forget the year because they didn't want to record rock bands. They wanted it to be like, they didn't want to deal with all that. So they shut down and it just like the doors shut and nothing else happened. And they reopened a few years ago and it still is like crushed velvet, shag carpet. Like it, it's so cool inside and it sounds great. And it's a great vibe. So we recorded there with Jason Warmer who also works a ton with uh, T-Bone and Mikey. And the one thing that was really nice is, is uh, Jason Warmer is a wonderful engineer and he yeah engineered and mixed it, but he also is a guitar player. So, 
It was fun. We, like for this record, I did uh, stereo guitar amps with two different pedal boards going to each amp. So Whoa. I, it was so fun. So, um, how I, do you, how all, do you deal with that? Tell me about the setup a little bit. Um, yeah. That like all, maybe some of the specifics Jason could tell you about, but it basically we, yeah, we had some split that allowed like my guitar went into some splitter and one went to Jason's pedal board actually, and into one amp and the other went into my pedal board with one amp. Um, and so we got to do two different sounds, which was really fun because I think I was nervous about going too bold. Like, you know, what if we have delays that then, or like too much, you know, what if I change my mind? I don't want to sound to be that, that modulated or something. So one was like slightly safer. Um, and I, I love, I love the way this, the guitar sounds like this is my, f- was the intention to mix them together or was, yeah. was it always, yeah. okay. We mix the sounds together. So I think I'm my, I mean, what Mikey did was amazing, but also I feel like I've evolved with my sound. Uh, yeah. So this, I'm like, I love so much more, you know, it feels like there's a little bit more pizzazz, a little bit, you know, more delays, some more modulations, a little like, just cause like what kind of stuff are you using? Um, so I have a bunch of like Earthquaker devices and Chase Plus Audio pedals. So we had on a lot of so- songs I use uh, Chase Plus Audio Dark World and. Oh, that's uh, sort of like a trippy reverb one, right? Yeah, I love that. Okay. Sh- 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 and then um, why am I blinking on the name? It's I like see it on my pedal board. <laughs> and it's like their chorus. Actually, it's funny. I have a whole I don't know how live this is. But I I kept notes of everything I did. Whoa, that's organized. I never do that. Well, I I'm not here. Where is, I actually here? I kind of want to find it. Where is it? Um, because uh, yeah, sometimes I'm very organized, but just because I wanted to remember. Because you know, you do something and you like think you're gonna remember, but then. Yeah. You never remember. Uh, no, I don't remember anything. I have no, you know. So yeah, okay. So yeah, I used a bunch of Flint Dispatch Master, like Flint Dispatch Master are two What's of my a other, Dispatch Master uh, Earthquaker devices. I like love their reverb. It's a reverb um, delay pedal that's really simple, but I find that it brings a little warmth. And same, yeah, yeah I love Flint. I used a, I never used compressor, but Jason had this um, a diamond compressor that was nice. I used his. Uh, Behringer vibrato as well. A little slapback, which was like a Maleco echo. Um, yeah, Memory Man. I brought my Memory Man, which I used for chorus a bunch. Oh, Dark World. Wait, no, no. What's the other one? I can't remember. That's the Chase Bliss one. That's the right? Chase Bliss. But there's a different Chase Bliss audio that I, I'm blanking on the name, uh, and I want to, f- but I want to find it, but I can't remember right now. Yeah, Univibe. Yeah. I used a Univibe on some stuff. Oh. Yeah, compressor unit. Getting into it. Yeah, because there's it like fun. there's 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 like none of that really on St. George, is there? It just sounds like a guitar plugged into an amp almost with Pretty some much. verb. Yeah, and you know, I mean, like that's how I practice, like mostly, and then some because there's something about really understanding what your fingers do and the subtleties because I think it's really easy to get distracted with other stuff and then you know when I get a new pedal or when I'm working something out I have it all out and I'm messing with things I'll mess with new pedals and stuff but there still is something for me so like sacred about just guitar and amp um because because you forget how endless that is in the same way you know like in a guitar ensemble it's like there's there could be five guitar players and it could be like oh my god what are you gonna do but it's like there's so much you can do. Yeah. Um, so I love exploring that too. And, but it was, it's also like now, now I'm like, I don't know, you have to get used to it. It's like, you know, and I guess the equipment would be like, if you have like a new outfit and you're like, can I pull this off? I don't know. And at first you feel really <laughs> awkward and then it's like your new look and you wear it all the time. <laughs> so it's like that with pedals sometimes too. I'm like, can I do a modulation and like be me or what are people thinking? And then I'm like, I fucking love this modulation i love this yeah. delay. I love having the like you know all this stuff happening like it, you gotta yeah. kind of ease into it like yeah making sure yeah so when you were tracking that way you'd split off from your guitar into the two completely different rigs into two completely different amps were you hearing them both yeah okay and so they're both in this in the room with you or were you isolated or how did you set up it, it's like kind of wild that there wasn't a lot of bleed, but me, yeah, Jen, Jay and I were all in the same room. I had mm-hmm. one amp with me behind some, um, like plexiglass thing Stuff. or some yeah. Yeah, like 
buffer thing. Um, one amp was right next to me. It did not bleed into Jay's stuff, which is crazy. And I had a second amp in a different room. And I, I don't remember where Jen's amp was, but I know she also had it. She did. I think she ended up doing mostly DI. So if, if you're going into the other guy's pedal board, was he controlling it? Or were you, did you kind of learn his board as well? And you were we- controlling that? We did it together. And like, also okay. like, I like just really trusted him too. So I do something and then, and then we'd like mess around with it. And he's like, Oh, this might sound cool. I'm like, cool, let's check it out. And then, you know, we would, Wicked. yeah, it was. Yeah. So it was, so I just, was, it felt so safe and exciting um, and safe, not like safe and like secure. I should say not safe. It felt like secure, exciting Jason. He's so great to work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I, it, it was a really great experience And it it was fun to have two sounds because, yeah, you can blend them. It's not in like, it felt uh, like more freeing. I was less afraid. That's cool. Was any of that stereo effects going through two amps or was it all just like one rig going to one amp, another rig going to another amp? Uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Two monos. Yeah. Interesting. And so did you mix it with him as well? Yeah, he mixed it and we went back on a couple things, but pretty much right away he got it. And like yeah. Jay likes to say, you know, he said Mikey was the fourth member on that record and, and Jason's the fourth member on this record because mm-hmm. he does add his extra touch. And what feels so good about it is it feels so alive. It feels so, I think the thing that people can get afraid of with Trio is that you're going to be like, where's the piano player or where's the layers? And I feel like this record even more so like the goal is it sounds like three people. It's a trio and it's full. Um, yep. Yeah. I feel like Booker T is for me like a really good example of that. We are not missing anyone. Exactly. It's perfect the way it is. Yeah. And uh-huh. like with space, God, there's something so like sacred about space. And, you know, we're just ha- like, I love like Jay starts a couple songs where it's just like him for whatever. If you, and it's, I don't know, or break. Uh, yeah. I, I am passionate about this. So is the intention then you're going to put this out next year and do a bunch of touring as that trio? Yeah, that's the goal. And okay. so I'm trying to like get on that all right now. I mean, I'm my, if anyone's listening, I need an agent, I need help. But yeah, <laughs> you know, I book, I email. So I actually have like, I'm meeting with someone today. I'm going to see, I, I just need like help with some stuff because it's hard to balance everything. And that's sort of what happened the yes. last few months. Like the record's been ready for a few months. Um, but I was maybe going to sign with a label, which I think I'm going to not do and do something else with them. Uh, and just put it out myself. There's something that just feels kind yeah. of more relevant about that right now, unless mm-hmm. I'm like on a label that's going to actually like pay for the record and like a different iteration, which isn't really happening. That's not where I'm at right now. But yeah, yeah. so I'm just going to put it out and I, I feel pretty excited about it. But yeah, the goal is to do more touring. And mm-hmm. for, even for where I'm at, it's not like I want to be gone for six months. You know, I think that the right. goal would be to Within be like, reason. Yeah, like be do like a West Coast run for a week or two, go to Japan for a couple weeks, you know, go to the East Coast for a couple weeks, like a week or two, you know, like do week or two long runs with Jen and Jay, because also they're Jen and Jay. It's like I can't. And while like we're a band, like I I think all of us. Yeah, it's 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 not it's hard to to make it. um, I I don't think any of us want to like. Uh, I don't know, like go in a van and like sleep on the floor. So it's not even like right now I'm worried about like, it's beyond money. This for me is just like, I I love it. I believe in it. I I just, um, so yeah. But so I think what we've been doing, but just more, you know, we've done some short runs for like long weekends and stuff. And it'd be nice just to bump it up for the next run. When you were out here playing in Nashville, did you, uh, was that a tour that you were on or no, and even that? that, like, I need to pair stuff better. Um, that was yeah. just like a one-off or something? So Jay was in Nashville, and so... Okay. Yeah, so Jen and, and Jen was going to go and visit him anyway, so I was like, I'll fly out, you know? Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I wondered, because I didn't see any other dates going on around there. I just... It, yeah. That, that seemed so. like a, a one-off, and I guess it was a one-off. 2024, cool. I'm going to do a better job of that. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> that's a cool place, though. Eh? It's a great. I, I loved seeing you guys there. I thought that was a fantastic venue yes. for what you were doing. It seemed. I perfect. know. I'd love to do another one there next year. I think. Yeah, Bryson does. Bryson Nelson. Yeah, does such a good job. For anyone that doesn't know, it's a it's a drum shop in Nashville. It's like five minutes from my house, but they they basically like clear the floor and then they it's in a, like an old car garage and they open the car the the doors up and and the audience is outside and sort of and then. 
the band. I guess it was still COVID was still sort of on, so people were kind of spread out a bit. Yeah, I think I think the in, anyone inside had to be masked. I, I, as I remember, it was twenty one probably. Yeah, it was still a little COVIDy for sure. Yeah, I've I've seen a couple shows there since then that have been more packed into the main room cool. than your guys's was. But yeah, hopefully a, next yeah. time we'll do that. But yeah, it was yeah that was a really fun show, memorably fun show. So kind of the other flip side of what you do is like side person to other people, and I guess most noted most notably the Jason Mraz Mraz gig, which is yeah. pretty high profile. Um, Tell me a little bit about how you approach that from a guitar player's point of view. And I know you play on some of the records as well. Um, maybe tell me a little bit about how that gig came about and just some of your experiences working with him. Yeah, um, I really do. Everything I in my career has happened really organically. And uh, like same with Jason, same with all my teaching stuff, same with my trio. It's not like I was like, I want a trio with Jen and Jay. It's like all that just sort of naturally happened, which I feel... I think that's when the best things happen that way. Um, but for Jason, I I, I kind of knew him from two different paths, but kind of the same. Like I played guitar for one for Jason's like one of his best friends, uh, Billy Galewood, Bush Wallace. So I was playing guitar for Billy, and also Jason was a fan of this Afrobeat funk band I was in. We like played, oh, really? yeah. We like did a couple sessions with him, played his engagement party. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, and that was like a really. We were called the Vibrometers. We were a band for like. The vibrometers? Yeah, or vibrometers. Cool. Like, no one knew. I don't even know to this day how you pronounce it. It was like vibrometer. So it was like a vibrometer or vibrometer. No idea. <laughs> but it was a really fun band. We did, like, you know, like Fellow Cootie, Budos Band. We had a bunch of original uh -huh. material, too. Um, and that helped my right hand playing a ton. Um, I, I, I miss uh, but yeah, so Jason was a fan of that band and then I was playing with his friend. So he had seen, that was a band that you were like playing around LA in or something. And yeah, he'd yeah. seen you. Okay. A lot of those like 10 PM to 1 AM gigs was that, and he, had, mm. we had like played in San Diego a bit and he was friends with the saxophone player, Aaron Leibowitz. So, um, yeah. And then we, we did a couple sessions at his house writing sessions, um, which was fun and like recording and then also, yeah, I like played with his best friend. So, and he'd like go to the shows and stuff sometimes. So I knew him and then I just got an email from him one day, just being like, hey, like I'm putting a new band together. Do you want to play this corporate gig in San Diego? And okay. you know, I like, I love, I always was like a big fan of his music and him as a person. Um, but I had never had an ex expectation because I don't know, I think like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I just wasn't. I it, it, so I was like shocked when I got the email and so excited. I was like, oh my god, I love your music. Yes, um, and yeah. So I from the beginning, I, I took it really seriously. I feel like like the skills I learned at USC and just like gigging with a bunch of artists in LA were really helpful. Of you know, like learning the songs well. And it was a there was no horn players, and he had been playing with horn players, so I like learned all the horn parts. You know, I, I learned all the like I learned yeah all the horn parts, all the different guitar parts, whether it was live or recorded, and just like went in and, and knew the music well. But it was just a one-off. It was a one-off. And then short, right after that gig, he was like, we're going to Brazil for two weeks. Do you want to go to Brazil? I was like, yes. And then he's like, we're, we're playing the Hollywood Bowl and going on tour for a couple weeks. Do you want to do that? Yes. Do you want to play my record? Yeah. You know, it's just like, I didn't know what it was going to be. And now I've been playing with him for six and a half years. Um, do, you, do you think when he first emailed you there, do you think he wanted, do you think he just needed a guitar player and he thought of you? Or do you think he was like, I need that Molly Miller thing because it's like, it's kind of a unique thing. And it doesn't like on his records, I mean, I don't know his music that well, but I've listened to the records that you play on. And there's, there's like a lot of songs where I can't tell if you're on them at all. And then there's a few where it's like, oh, well, that's clearly Molly. So yeah. I don't know if, I don't know if in those other ones, you're actually doing more like very discreet like studio-y guitar kind of stuff or if it's just on those ones where it's clearly you i feel like i've probably played like on the last record and the new one that came out last week actually a few days ago i probably played on like three or four tracks and on those tracks okay. i feel like you can hear me um mm -hmm. and same with the last couple records i played on like a hand i played on a few tracks on each of the records and yeah. he ha he calls me to come in and do my thing really he's like oh, I, yeah. want, okay. I want a molly solo right here and then i don't know what else do you think you know and then like yeah i'm like let's do some chicken picking let's do some like i normally come with some <laughs> ideas but normally he has like i think i have a couple features on each of his records on the last yeah. three records a couple features that's uh, pretty cool yeah i mean that's the thing about jason like you know i think a lot of pop gigs it's not like this i like i feel like i like I got a dream pop gig. Jason called. He's like, 
And I'll be like, what do you want me to do? He's like, do you, I want you to do you like take a solo. Don't be afraid. Go, go do you like, yeah. And like, sometimes he has notes like, Oh, I'd really like to hear this. Uh, don't play that ninth there or like whatever, but mostly it's like, do you. And Mm -hmm. I've done, I've played with a lot of musicians and a lot of bands. And so like, I feel like I'm a good listener. So it's like, do you have to, is it hard to carve a space out for what you do in his, in the entire show? mm -hmm. You know, no, and it varies. Like I just did a gig with Jason where it was me, bass, drums, and Jason, the four of us. And that was like, it was nice because there was a ton of space. Like, like, but yeah. now like on tour, and we've done a lot of tours with like what he calls the super band, which is like, you know, 12 people on stage. It's a lot. Jeez. So yeah. the last few tours have been like that. Like a lot of. So that's like keys, horns, keys, another horns. guitar player. Yeah. And like the other people that like Jason will play, mostly Jason plays acoustic, he plays electric on a couple things, but like sometimes someone will play like another, another, but they're more auxiliary guitar. Like there's not another lead mm-hmm. guitar player, horns, background vocals, keys. We did a reggae tour that actually did have two guitar players, but the other guy was not a lead guitar player, um, rhythm, uh, organ, like just full, you know, percussion. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff going on and that's where it can get dangerous. And I think, um, I'm very cognizant of that. You know, I, I had a wedding yep. the other night, which I rarely do, but it was sort of like that, the, you know, the thing that you don't want to happen, happened where like everyone's playing and no one's listening. Right. Uh, yeah. And like with Jason, I, it's like, I, I think, yeah. And sometimes I have to remind myself, it's like, yeah, like this, this is not about you. And like when I play with my little brother's band, that can happen too. It's a full band. It's often like a six piece band that's not always used to having guitar. So it's like three horns and, and our two horns now piano. Uh, and they're all like musicians that play. They're, they're amazing. So yeah, it's like not carving space for myself, but also just like, yeah, sometimes it's just like, shut up, Molly, don't play. Like the best <laughs> thing you can do is just listen or like yeah. a, a little like, tch- like a little like rhythm part a little like chicken pick and single note thing or just chunks or you know don't yeah like things that you, you've learned you learn from playing a lot which is like if there's a space it does it's not your turn it's like if there was mm-hmm. like one piece of pizza and you just always assumed it was yours you know and you're like at a party <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> that piece of pizza is like there's seven people that are eyeing it so like cool it uh is there a musical director or in that Not band? really. No. Okay. And like, that's also what kind of makes it unique where, and, and cool because it is very much Jason hires people and he like, he's like, you do you. I'd say like Jason's the musical director, you know? Yeah. So ultimately you answer to him for how things sound. Like there's nobody saying, hey, Molly, maybe you should try this or do this yeah. or blah, blah, blah. Okay. And like, I, I, sometimes someone will suggest something, you know, like a, a, like a bunch of my really close friends are in the band. So sometimes like the piano player, Daniel Mondelman, like, you know, sometimes they'd be like, oh, why don't you do this, like this, like thing with me? It might be not nice or cool you know like sometimes we yeah. we'll communicate with each other sometimes like we do that and I feel like it's for each other and we're all so close and don't have egos where it's like it, it is cool that that's the thing like I'd rather have like a, it kind of be this like friend thing where it's like or like not even just like a musical thing you know so yeah and we'll, we'll give each other notes sometimes but it's never like your tone is wrong on this song and on the next song <laughs> you have to do, like there's no like MD that's like riding my ass you know it's like jason will have some notes yeah. and like as we'll talk about the shows as like you know like as i don't know uh as band members as employees as people who want to make good music yeah yeah that's interesting because usually bands like that have a specific music director yeah almost every time i've experienced it it's for sure been, yeah and the touring is it uh i don't even know like is he playing in stadiums or like what are the venues that you're playing with yeah him? it depends where we're at like in the states i'd say most spaces are like th- i don't know like three to six thousand sometimes we'll do a 10 or 15 sometimes yeah. we we'll do a two you know when we're in asia they're bigger venues when we, it like kind of varies you know like i feel like in here like we sold out hollywood bowl where, where there's a mirror weather i think that's like 15 like we'll do some bigger and some like Crazy. five you know um a lot of what you do that there's a lot of subtlety and nuance does that sort of go out the window <laughs> window a little bit when you're playing to a fifteen thousand person crowd uh <laughs> I don't know. I don't maybe I don't know. I mean, okay. they're different things. Like Jason actually yeah. has had me open as a tree like the trio's open, not with Jen and Jay, with oh. other members who were in Jason's band, Tamir Barzali and Andre de Santana. That's uh, cool. So in those I feel like, you know, I still can do some subtlety. But yeah, it's probably a little bit like people are less likely to be as intimately listening at like yeah. you know, where I typically play with my trio versus like 
a, a field where people are like getting beer and eating kettle corn and ready to listen to I'm yours. You know, they're not less yeah. like, let me hear that. Like, what's the, what's sca- like, whatever, you know, <laughs> less that'll yeah. do. But, you know, I still do me like I, Jason. I get a bunch of, so I get a bunch of features each night. Like I'm really cool. lucky. Like I don't, it's not like I have like one feature. Like I get a bunch of features and like Jason's, Jason's the best boss. He's just like, he wants everyone to be them. He wants everyone to be featured. His ego is so not at the center of the stage. It's like, I think he believes like the best show is when like, it's like shared with, yeah, everyone gets to do their thing. Anytime I've seen you, it's, which is twice, I guess, but then I've seen some stuff on YouTube. It's usually you're playing a 335. Is that still your thing? Like when you go out with him as well? Yeah. This is my sweet thing. Um, Is that a... 70s, 70s 80s that's 78. like my okay. this is definitely my favorite guitar my telly's right there i play that a ton i'm getting an albert lee music man built for me right now that i love i love my les paul oh, really okay yeah. so when you go out with jason do you just take the 335 that that my the love of my life stays home so no that oh. one I don't, i'd like it's too scary to take out and at a certain really? point I'm playing through a Helix. I got some amps and like, it's getting mic, but also I have it like, there's like so many variables of like mics, speakers, whatever, that like, I'm not taking my 335. Like my telly. So what, what do you take? Do my you telly, take telly, consistently uh-huh. my telly and my LP. And then I have a couple other variables. So like, I'll bring my telly, LP, music man is the les paul is there anything special or is it like a pretty stock les paul it's a gold top uh, mm-hmm. p90 that sounds mm-hmm. amazing but weighs four pounds more than what i want it to weigh yeah I <laughs> bet. <laughs> yeah those yeah. things are heavy and you've got a little like you use sort of the same pedal board no matter what your gig is whether it's jason mraz or whether it's your trio or do you customize that side of things i've customized my pedal board for jason stuff before i have the remnants of it over there um, but I've gone Helix the, last year and this year I'm going Helix for Jason. And then so I So that's have, fully, fully digital. Is that what that is? I don't even yeah. know what the Helix is. Helix okay. is, yeah. One of those, like it has like amp modelers and everything. So I could just have the Helix and no amps. But what I do is I'll have two lines running out of the Helix. One goes to an amp, which is mm-hmm. a Benson, Benson Monarch. So I'll have oh, cool. the Benson behind me and that's like, oh, like I feel it. I hear it. That's like. Is that yeah. a is that a one twelve? Yes, I think I'm pretty sure. Yes, it's it's not uh, at my apartment right now where I'd go look. I could look online online too, but yeah, no, I think it's a one. It's sort of it's sort yeah. of deluxe, like it, yes, it's a one twelve okay. actually. Yeah, because the 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 Nathan Junior, which I use at home and for my trio a ton, is one ten. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I have a Benson behind me and then that's like one line and one line is direct out with like an amp modeler like, cause it adds a little more consistency and like the, the front of house likes to blend the two sounds. So, so wait, so, so the Helix goes into an amp modeler. What is the Helix doing then? Bunch of pe- It's like my pedal. So it's a, my pedal board. Plus there's an amp modeler going direct out. Okay. And for one line, and one line's just the pedals that's going to my amp. The Helix okay. is nice because it's more consistent. I, it's like while I'll get my pedal board set up and stuff, it's just it's so much more consistent. I'm I, I've had a few things where it's like I don't know, like weird sound stuff happens, and I'm spending an afternoon annoyed. I'm on stage, and suddenly I'm getting feedback, or like I don't know. So it's it's been it worked really well last year, and all the stuff we had this year. Um, and so I've been doing that, which has been nice. And the Helix is great. Like there's just everything you could want. Plus I add an overdrive and a wah pedal to the side. Cause while they have okay. those, I'm still attached to certain sounds of mine. Yeah, for sure. But modulation yeah. delay, they're great in there. Yeah. And so you, do you program it per song or do you just kind of have a sound that you use for the whole show or how does, how Both. does that work? I Both. have some okay. tunes that are really specific that I'll, it's like, I feel like dancing. This is my pedal board. Um, but sometimes for a lot of the show, it's just like Molly's board. And I have like the eight sounds that I use for most of Jason's stuff. It's pretty organic. It's not like, you know, I'm not doing yeah. too wackadoodle sounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like as far as guitar goes, because you are you are clearly very interested in guitar. Who are the real beacons for you as far as like learning, but also like who you sort of modeled yourself playing wise after up to a certain point? Like after a while, obviously, you've kind of managed to find your own voice and you probably don't do it in the same way. But when you were learning things and like getting into the guitar, who were the people for you that were the yeah. shining lights? I mean, my first favorite guitar player was, J- was Jimi Hendrix. 
Um, it was like Jimi Hendrix and Clapton, Blink-182. Um, but like <laughs> Jimi Hendrix was a big one. And then I got really into jazz. It was like Grant Green, West, Django. Um, you know, I love Julian Lodge and Blake Mills. Contemporary guitar players like Adam Levy, um, Anthony Wilson in LA. I love him. And like my friends. Yeah, like Rich Hinman I love. But then all, Sister Rosetta Tharp was a big one. Uh, really? Steve Cropper. Yeah, Sister Rosetta Tharp. I got super, super into, transcribed a ton of her stuff. I did my dissertation on the pioneering women of the guitar. So it was yeah. Sister Rosetta Tharp, Mabel Carter, and uh, Memphis Mini. So I spent a bunch of time kind of checking their oh, stuff cool. out. And yeah. while they're all incredible, there was something about Sister Rosetta Tharp. Yeah. I tone. Mean, tone. Oh, my God. Come uh, on voice she just like made so many statements and and, and like you know I, I analyzed it too so it was like a lot of really cool chromatic stuff cool uh, double stops a lot of motifs that were being developed really thoughtfully that's interesting too because she the way she plays there are things that remind me about the way that you approach like you really you dig in way harder than like a your average jazz player would dig, would dig in I feel like yeah and that might come from somebody like that where yeah she was like reefing on that thing it wasn't oh yeah oh yeah it's not like these like sweet little like no she she is going hard yeah so much of yeah she was a rock and roll player you know yeah yeah Yeah. so for sure i could see that but yeah it is a a mixture of like jazz and like maybelle carter was she was a was she strictly a finger picker she a thumb picker she started yeah but she had not she had like her thumb pick and and yeah did all the the um the Maybell scratch is what they call it. Right. The Carter scratch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So country too. Like I love country guitar playing, you know, and, and like, I feel like on the new record, maybe it comes out a little bit more. I hear a little Jimmy Bryant in there probably. Yeah. And, Oof. yeah. But you don't use a thumb pick ever. Do you? I did at one point I studied it and checked it out and was doing it. But now I'm kind of a religious uh, hybrid picker with these Fender celluloid heavies. Yeah. Okay. I like, it was actually like, I had to play Blackbird the other day and I did it just finger style. And even that I was kind of like, wow, I'm like, so I used to do more finger style if I'm picking like different stuff. But now I'm just like hybrid picking is my go-to. And like, so are you using your fingers a lot? You've, you've always got the pick in your hand, but you're using your fingers a lot. Yeah. A fair amount. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I don't even keep track of it. Some song, but yes, definitely a lot. For specifically like that chicken pickany kind of thing, or like, are you using it for different textures as well? And Yeah. Like, you know, your fingers are a little warmer. Um, and some of the sounds I do, and I'm like, I don't know, my alien's my guitar. But yeah, yeah. It's like certain things I do. I feel like my sound is very dependent. You know, I do like a lot of like tense and stuff where I'm like, or some of the runs I do. I don't know if you can hear this. I'm waiting for my amp to turn on. I can hear it. So yeah, it'll be like, uh, I don't know. Like all these sort of like. And you know, maybe I'll, yeah. So I, I do some stuff where it is like very hybrid picky. And then I do some stuff where it's just like, uh, I mix the finger and the pick. Because of the spread, um, the fingers are sweeter. So yeah. And I don't at this point consciously think, use your finger here, use your pick here. It just Right. It just happens. That's a good space to be in. Yeah. The less I have to think about, I, the, the happier <laughs> I am. I close my eyes. <laughs> yeah. So up for guitar, did did you ever go through a point of like really being transcribe-y and like learning people's shit like note for oh, yeah. note? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, um, I transcribed a bunch of, yes. And I even like, I started a, a John Schofield transcription last week. I don't do probably twice a year. I'll do a transcription still. Like uh-huh. I still just for fun or yeah. for a class or just oh. cause you're like, I gotta, I gotta school up on some Schofield. Yeah. For my own edification. I mean, like <laughs> I want to grow, you know, like yeah, sure. I am like, I, I think that's the other like thing about being in school is like, you know, there's all these things like, oh, I just want to work. I want to tour. And like, yeah, I probably learned more at gigs than what I learned in class, you know, 
But there's something about the the structure of school and having assignments that I just love and the feedback. Um, I, I mean, I learned a lot in school, but also like that's why I still have those habits of I like giving myself assignments of, OK, like you have to do a chord melody for a new tune. OK, you have to write a new tune. You have to do a transcription and just like study what they're doing. And like because I think it, it, it just helps grow your playing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so. Mm-hmm. I started a Schofield one and then today I was hanging with my friend, yeah, Nadav, Nadav Pellet. And I like need to get the, the, um, Ari San. He was like telling, cause we were talking about like, it just got, got nerdy real quickly. We were talking about Phrygian. And he's like, oh yeah, I got really into Phrygian cause it's guitar players. And I'm like, oh, he's like, I transcribed the, his solo off bomb bomb. I think it's called or something. And he's okay. like, so now I'm kind of like, oh, cool. Like, I love your playing. Maybe I'll transcribe him as well and get some new lines and just not even li- just some expanding my vocabulary. And, you know, I don't want to I am not stagnant. We are not stagnant as musicians. Yeah. You know, we should never yeah. be stagnant. Did you spend a lot of time doing solo guitar arrangements of standards? Was that like ever a thing for you that you did a lot of? I, I Yeah, I was thinking about it because I'm teaching a chord melody class right now uh, mm-hmm. just online. Um, and yeah, I do those throughout the year too, which are always really fun, like six, seven week master classes on, on a topic. Um, but yeah, since I was like 16, I've been into it. Um, yeah, I just, I love solo guitar because yeah, there's, it's all this like, how do you approach doing a solo standard arrangement? My chord melody class. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, (laughs) there's just, you know, what's the, what's the song? What's the lyric? How, how do you like, what's the message I'm trying to get through? You know, like, don't get too wanky, do some cool and interesting, like harmonization without like detracting from the melody. Um, so yeah, I love counterpoint. I love, I, it's the same reason I love trio too, really. It's like, there's something about figuring out how to tell a story in a new way or, or, or you, the story, how you view the story. Cause like, you know, how a song is like you hear lyrics and it can mean one thing to you and something else to someone else. And just getting my own concept of, of what I'm trying to, um, tell. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Will you ever do a solo guitar record? I really want to. It's just not at the fore. I, I, you know, that should really be a goal of mine because it wouldn't be that hard. I have so many guitar. I, I could do a record tomorrow, probably to tell you the truth of my oh, solo yeah? arrangements. It's just okay. whether it's just whether it be original or, or not original. And I think it would be fun just to do a covers uh, solo guitar record. And I could, I have so many that I still play because that's actually how I like to warm up. It's like, first I'll sit there and just like play a little, I'll like be like E major. Okay. E major all over my guitar, make it feel good. Does it sound nice? Oh, I'm just like, you know, like, and then I play solo guitar tunes. What would, what would be the first one that you jump into if you're going to do a solo? Yeah. I mean, whatever. Yeah, it depends. But the ones I, I I do some of my original ones. I just did a couple of Disney ones. I just did. Um, uh, yeah, you know, a dream is a wish your heart makes. Yeah. And I also did. Um, yeah, I did that one. So I've been playing that. Beautiful. Uh, come rain or come shine. I did an arrangement of that that I still love playing. Did you ever learn like Jim Hall, those kind of solo yeah, transcriptions? I've yeah. taken stuff from them, but it, I was thinking about it. It's kind of funny. Like, like you know, Joe Pass. Uh, yeah, like Joe Pass more so. Jim Hall, Johnny Smith. I've listened to more so Johnny Smith and Joe Pass, a ton of their like solo guitar work. Um, I'm really into listening. I love so like Julian Lodge, like his solo record on the acoustics, amazing. That's great. Um, World's Fair. What about Lenny Bro? Did you ever check out Lenny Bro? Love, yeah. yeah. Like I like so like there's Noel Atchoke, I think is how you say it. Like there's so many great solo guitar records. George Van Epps. That like yeah, I love oh, yeah. listening to these players. Um, I think you should do a solo record. I think That's I'm going to. I think this conversation is maybe, and I don't want to just, yeah, Surfer Girl, like that was one that got me really into doing like pop arrangements too. And I've had to find my balance of like, I'm a jazz, I play jazz, I play pop, I play like, and like trying mm-hmm. to have, still have my voice be really clear with it, which I think I do. So aware of when, I love playing that tune. How does that one go? Yeah beauty i don't know i love it i just yeah because that's the same thing where you're like 
you have to be so you have to listen to your fingers and that's what like for solo guitar records it is nice to be pretty bare for solo guitar playing i think and it's nice to yeah. sure like all this stuff can be fun modulation delay reverb it's all fun but there's something about the art of guitar amp and fingers with just a pick yeah, that i love you're gonna bring it back Amen. Let's do it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Listen, thanks so much for spending time with me today. Um, So the record's going to come out. Are you, are you able to say what it's called or anything? Uh, Sure. Okay. The, the, the title I have right now is um, that I think I'm going to stick. I kind of love it. The Ballad of Hotspur. Ooh, I like it. Yeah. So, so that's, that's going to be the Molly Miller trio Ballad of Hotspur. It's going to come out sometime in early 2014. I like you're planning ahead. That's good. Yeah. Most people, most people don't, I mean, take their time with this with that you honestly know? Like if i could good. i'd put it out next week but my, i yeah. don't have vinyl while i have my artwork basically done like i'm just like it takes it takes, it takes so forever. long so yeah, yeah. Be, be, in two weeks i'll have my entire plan set and everything else roll in but and hopefully some tour dates around the country are you going to potentially go out of country as well or we'd love to it's you know yeah Send a lot of emails. Don't get all the responses I'd love. But, you know, yes, that's the goal. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I love your plan and look forward to hearing the next record and whatever you get up to next. Yeah. Good luck with, with the album. Thank you for chatting with me. Yeah. All right. Well, um, say hi to Jen and Jay if you see them. I know Jay's out on tour with. Going to see Jen some... tonight and I'll see Jay in Are a couple you? weeks when I, yeah, when we have our gig. So I'll, I'll tell All him right. I say hi. You say hi. And so nice to meet you. I hope to see you in Nashville again soon or, or somewhere else. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Molly. Thanks. All right. Have a good one. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening, everybody. Music Makers and Soul Shakers podcast is produced at the Hen House Studio in East Nashville, Tennessee. Please remember to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can find more info on this episode, including show notes and an audio playlist for Spotify and Apple Music at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Thank you again to our sponsors this season, Union Tube and Transistor, Spectra 1964, The Deering Banjo Company, Mule Resonator Guitars, and The Henhouse Hang. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time for another chilling episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. Over and out.